What's up guys, this is Jeremy with Fundamental Tennis. Are you tired of hitting the frame, whether it's your forehand or your backhand, maybe your serve or your volley? I know exactly how frustrating it is because when I hit the frame, it drives me nuts. And I know when my players hit the frame, it drives them nuts as well as, again, myself. Now, the reasons why you hit the frame, that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. We're also gonna talk about how to not hit the frame and the benefits of hitting the strings, including you'll get more power, control, and accuracy. I'm also gonna tell you how watching contact is a technique used to perform well under pressure. And not watching contact, on the other hand, and, and looking at your target when you're in the hitting phase is actually the definition of choking. Now, I will say that when you hit the strings or when you hit the middle, the sweet spot of the racket, it also just feels better. It's a great sensation. It's a large reason as to why we play tennis. Now, I'm gonna tell you uh, for each individual stroke, all the main strokes, we're gonna go over each one and I'll tell you why you're hitting the frame on that stroke. I'm also gonna give you drills for helping you to consistently hit the sweet spot so that you will enjoy playing tennis more and maximize power, control, and accuracy. You do not want to miss this. There are four reasons as to why you hit the side of the racket or the frame of the racket, as opposed to where we want to hit, of course, is the center of the strings or the sweet spot. Now, the main reason by far as to why you hit the side of the racket on whatever stroke it may be is because you're not watching the contact, okay? Now, notice that I didn't say watch the ball. Everybody knows to watch the ball and everybody does watch the ball. However, people do not watch it hit their racket, okay? Every level of the game, I see it so often, players do not watch contact. And it is something that people, pros, players have talked for 100 years, okay? Watch the ball, watch the ball. Now, the problem with that is it's not specific enough. Again, we want to watch contact, all right? Now, the main reason we don't watch contact is because we are not present. We're not in the moment. We're looking in the future in a negative way. In fact, not watching contact is the definition of choking, at least in my opinion. I'm very confident about that, and I know it helps me so much to watch contact as it helps my confidence and it helps me control the ball and I seem to not miss when I watch contact. Now, watch me closely here. So, watching contact is a technique used to stay in the moment, to stay present. If you've ever studied at all about uh, sports, uh, mental toughness, especially in tennis, it's all about watching, sorry, <laughs> it's all about, it is about watching contact. It's all about staying present and it, it's, it's about not dwelling on the past or the future in a negative way. Now, if you watch me closely here, watch my eyes in comparison to when I make contact. This is me not watching contact. Watch this. This is, I don't want to miss, okay? Watch again. This is what not to do. Notice I'm not watching the ball hit the racket. This is, I don't want to screw up. Now, if I watch contact, this is what you're programming into your brain. Watch this, I got this, okay? So you're staying present, you're in the moment, you're not watching your target. The more confident a player is, in my experience, the more likely they are to watch contact. So I want you to have confidence and you can create confidence by watching contact. Again, whether it's the volley, the ground stroke, overhead, serve, return, if you watch contact, that is a technique used to perform well under pressure. So from a mental perspective, psychologically, it is huge to watch contact because first of all, of course, you're gonna hit the strings more often, but it's gonna help you perform well under pressure. And I know from experience myself in doing that and teaching my players, it has helped them immensely to simply not watch the ball, but watch contact. If you're not watching the ball, you're gonna be watching your intended target of where you're aiming. Now, this is very natural to do because you've done many sports and activities in your life in which you should watch your target to help you aim. For example, a quarterback or a baseball pitcher, they watch their target to help with their aim. Now in tennis, however, it is not the case because you're holding an object and you're trying to hit 
a, an object that you're receiving. So you need to focus and track that ball into your racket. Because as humans, we can only focus on two or three degrees of our 180 degree visual that we can see. So of that two or three degrees, it should be the tennis ball. Now, if you look up at your target, choking, remember, you are not going to hit the ball on the strings near as often as if you watch the ball with that two or three degrees of focus you have. You watch contact, keep the head still, okay? Because when that head moves up, when you look at your target, your head moves, and the head movement is going to alter the angle of your racket face, which will not be good for you controlling that ball. So the head weighs quite a bit, so when the head moves, it changes the angle of the racket, and that, of course, is what controls the ball. So keeping the head still, watching the contact. Now, another thing is players often watch the ball in three different ways, really. One is they don't ever watch the contact. Two, it's a little better than the first one, is they watch the contact, but they watch it with their peripheral vision. We already talked about how much you can focus on, just that two, three degrees. So the best thing you want to do is, of course, watch contact and watch it with your central vision. Roger Federer does that, and he's pretty good at tennis. So watching the contact with your central vision. I like to tell players to watch the ball with your nose or point your nose to the ball when you make contact to ensure that their head is in the right alignment and you're watching it with your central vision. So I've clarified that it's not just watch the ball, it's watch the contact. Now what about the ball should we watch? We want to watch the height, speed, spin, depth, and direction of the ball that we're receiving. Now before I talk about the other reasons why you may be hitting the frame, I'm going to show you some drills to help you practice watching contact and creating that new positive muscle memory. Here are a couple drills to help create a habit in watching the contact. I'm going to be demonstrating these drills with my forehand. However, you can do these drills with any stroke you like. I will be on the deuce side baseline, aiming for the opposing deuce side baseline, in which I have a cone there as a target. You can use any object you like as your target. Now, if you don't have somebody to hit balls to you or toss you balls, you can just drop the ball for yourself and do the same drill. So in this drill, you're going to be watching the contact, and then after contact, I want you to watch where the ball was hit. So you're not gonna be looking to see if your ball went in. There's no visual wandering. You're staying present. In fact, you're almost going in the past of watching where the ball was hit. So when you receive the ball, I'll first show you dropping it for those of you who don't have someone to help you. So I drop the ball, I watch the contact, and then I watch where the ball was hit. So really exaggerating that. So I'm gonna receive a couple balls. I want you to notice my head alignments. If you can't see my eyes, you can see that I'm watching it a little bit like Federer. Maybe I'm not as handsome as Federer, but you can see how I'm watching the contact, and I'm watching where the ball was hit. So it's a good exaggeration. Most of the time, I think that you can know if you hit the ball in or out just by how it felt. So you really don't need to be looking up anyway. Uh, and by the way, your target does not move. You don't need to be looking at your target. That's a joke I like to tell a lot of my players. So the next drill that you can do that is similar to that one is you're going to watch contact, of course. And then right after contact, you're going to close your eyes and visualize that contact that you just had. So the eyes closed is to get you to not watch your target. You definitely can't watch your target with your eyes closed. At least I can't. So watch this, I'm gonna receive a ball. Hopefully you can see my eyes closed here. So after I hit, I close my eyes. I watch the contact, however, right after I hit, I close my eyes. One more time, close my eyes. Make sure you watch the hit first. I did this once with a lady and she closed her eyes before she hit. I was like, no, 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 you got to watch the contact. That's what this is all about. So that, there's that drill. Now, here's another drill you can do. Again, I'll give you a few variations of drills. You can do one of these or all of these. These are all terrific drills that help my players a lot. And uh, there's, here, here's how it goes. There's three 
uh, quality of contact. There's three ways you can make contact. One is you hit only the frame. Another is the ball hits a little bit uh, close to the sweet spot or center of the racket, but mainly to the side of the racket on the strings, but not quite the frame. That's not as good as hitting the center of the strings, which is what we're looking for. A lot of players actually don't have the awareness of when they hit the ball on the strings and when they hit the frame, unless it's really obvious. So what I like to do is this drill, where after you make contact, you just think about how it felt when you hit. The easier it feels or the better it feels, the more in the center you hit the ball, of course, and the heavier it feels, the the more it doesn't feel good, uh, the more uh, you know that you, that you hit the side of the racket, and you'll also be able to hear it. And then by watching where the ball went, if you hit the frame, you're gonna, you're gonna see that ball go who knows where. So right here, I'm gonna tell you what I get. All right, there was definitely the sweet spot. You could hear it, you could feel it. Okay, that one was the strings, but it wasn't the sweet spot. I'll try again. That was really good, that felt great. I wish I could hit like that every time. All right, that was the, towards the bottom here. That wasn't quite as good. That was a pretty good one. So you could even figure out where on the racket you keep hitting. A lot of people have a pattern. They keep hitting the top of the frame or the bottom of the frame. Find that pattern if you have a pattern, okay? Uh, by the way, again, I want to mention Federer. He is probably the best tennis player ever, and he happens to watch the ball or the contact longer than anyone ever, and I don't think that's a coincidence. By the way, Nadal watches the ball as, as well as anyone aside from Federer, and he's pretty good too. I don't think it's a coincidence that the two best players in the world right now are, are watching the ball very well. They're staying present. Check out this clip. This is slow-mo of me doing what not to do. As you can see, my head is rotating with my body's rotation. And this is a tendency a lot of players have is as their hips and shoulders rotate into contact and past contact, the head rotates with the body, but that is incorrect. See, watch how my head moves with my body. I'm not watching the hit. Now here, you can see everything rotates except my head. My head stays still. I watch where the ball was hit. And one more time here, you'll see my head. I'm watching the contact. My head stays still throughout the contact phase. My head is still even though everything else in my body is rotating. So the body's rotating, but the head must not rotate, it must remain still. Another fantastic drill to help you watch contact is to simply have a small piece of duct tape, tape it onto the center of your strings, and then play tennis with the tape on your racket like that. When the ball hits the center of your strings where the tape is, you're going to hear a different sound and then you will know based on that sound that you hit the center of the strings. However, if you hit the side of the strings where the duct tape is not placed, then you will hear the typical sound and it'll feel a little different probably. So having that duct tape will give you feedback on if you watch the ball efficiently or not based on if it hit the tape or if it did not hit the tape. Now, another great simple drill is each time you receive the ball, Especially when the ball gets close to you and you're about to hit it. Watch the seams on the tennis ball. See these white lines here? And try to read or see the color of the writing on the ball. That's going to get you to really have that laser focus on the tennis ball and get you to really focus on the ball as opposed to just looking at the ball. Now, another great uh, a tip, cue, or, or visual, uh, if we go back to watching where the ball was hit after we have hit the ball is we watch the contact of course and then after contact we watch where the ball was hit until we have finished our extension meaning we watch where the ball I'll demonstrate lefty so you can see me here we watch where the ball was hit until we have extended our hand our hitting hand out to the target as far as it goes Okay, so another uh, visual that's similar to that is watch where the ball was hit until you have followed through, then you look up at your target because that uh, drill we did a couple drills ago, obviously you're not going to watch the hit and then never look up. So when to look up, I just told you, watch the hit, watch where it was hit, and once you get to the extension or the follow through 
phase, you look up to see where that ball went. Now, I'd like to give you a quick story. I think it's pretty funny. I had a, a ladies team or, or ladies doubles lesson and one of the ladies I have uh, was going to hit a finishing volley. So she had a high, slow ball close to the net. And as I'm watching her hit this ball, she's looking at her target. She's um, aiming for this target and she's swinging toward this target. But because she's looking at her target, um, she actually hit the frame and the ball went for a winner in the opposite direction. And once in a while you get lucky hitting the frame, the ball has a weird spin or something and you win the point. But the uh, opposing, the opponent said to her, oh, great shot, that was awesome. They had no idea that uh, she shanked it. You know, so she should know, you should know by the sound um, that you have hit the ball on the frame. So I, th I wanted to share that story. Is, at least I think it's really funny that she's aiming here, swinging there, and looking there, and it hits the frame and it's a winner in the opposite direction. And I don't even know if she realized that, that it hit the frame. Um, but I wouldn't count on that happening very often, so that's why I've made this video here for you. The second reason and second most common reason as to why you're hitting the frame is mental toughness. It is a mental toughness issue. If you are nervous or too excited or anxious, you're tight, you're choking on a big moment, then you're not gonna be able to focus on the ball you're receiving, therefore you're much more likely to hit the side of the racket. Now, what is the fix for this? We've already talked about it for several minutes now, and that is to watch contact. If you watch contact, you are going to be present. Again, watching contact is a technique used to perform well under pressure. So if you are nervous or tight or anxious, watch that contact, and I think it's really gonna help your confidence and improve your play. Now, the third reason as to why you may be hitting the frame has to do with the body. If you are moving a part of your body that shouldn't be moving during the contact, or you're moving a part of your body too early or too late, then that is going to affect the racket, the movement of the racket, which of course can cause you to have some miss hits or to shank the ball off the side of the racket. So I'm going to talk about the overhead and serve first. Again, this is about the body and how the body can cause you to hit the frame. Many times players toss the ball and they get into this trophy position here, but very soon after they release the ball, they drop their non-dominant arm abruptly and too early. What this is gonna do is it's gonna cause you to drop your dominant side, your racket arm, and especially your head down and too early. When your head comes down because your non-dominant arms come down too early, it's gonna be difficult to watch the contact. And as you know, when you don't watch contact, it's much more likely that you're gonna hit the frame. So here is a visual to help, help you and, and know how long you should keep your non-dominant arm up to allow you to keep your head and eyes up. When you're in the trophy position, as you can see, I uh, have my racket arm. I'm in this throwing position. If we look at my racket arm here, once I start bringing the racket towards my head, that is the time when the non-dominant arm should come down. Okay, so as the racket's starting to come towards my head, the hand is going to be at about the level of the racket head, as you can see here. So as the racket goes to the head, the left arm starts to come down soon after that. So that is your cue as to when that left arm should come down. So same thing goes for the overhead. If you're hitting a frame on your overhead, keep that non-dominant arm up as long as you can to allow you to keep your head up. Now another uh, a little drill that I like to do, another exaggeration, it's really just like what I did with the forehand. You can do that with any stroke again. So you're going to uh, toss the ball, do your regular service motion, and then after you've hit the ball, you keep your chin and eyes up at where the ball was hit. So you're watching the contact after contact, you don't watch where the ball went. You can do that for the serve and the overhead. Now, 
When it comes to the forehand, here's how a lot of people hit the frame in the forehand. This might be the most common shot that players hit the frame because there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things that can potentially go wrong. When the ball comes, if your non-dominant arm, this is again, the non-dominant arm plays a really important role. I'd like to do a video in the future just about the non-dominant arm and its importance in other strokes. When hitting a forehand or when preparing for a forehand, your left arm or your non-dominant arm should be straight or close to straight and parallel to the baseline. You'll see probably at least 99% of pros get into a very similar uh, position to that. The reason the left arm or non-dominant arm should be like this is because if it's like this, your non-dominant side of your body is going to open up too early, very likely, and that's going to be a movement uh, of your body that shouldn't be moving just yet, and that's going to cause you to often hit the frame. I had a, a girl uh, just this week, actually, she's the most uh, coordinated, most talented player I have, and she would hit the frame in almost every forehand one day uh, in this week's lesson, and, and I couldn't figure it out because she was watching the ball well, and then I realized that when she prepares, her preparation of her non-dominant arm is very weak. So she's like this. So once I had her get that arm straight, she was able to keep her body connected and more stable and stay in the shot longer and allow her to control her body and her arm and therefore her racket so that she can hit the ball cleanly. And after that, she told me that it really helped her a lot in, in hitting the ball in the strings. Now, when it comes to the volley, a lot of times people will swing too much. The more swing you have, the more motion in the body you have on a volley, especially with the upper body, the harder it is to hit the ball on the strings. So keeping it simple, as you know, uh, it's very important to keep the, the upper body quiet and still, and then the lower body does all the work. A visual that I love to tell my players is visualize a duck in a pond. If you are underwater looking up at the dock, at, at the duck, sorry, you'll see the feet of the duck are paddling like crazy, right? Again, I'm talking about the volley here, but if you look uh, down at the duck from above the water, his upper body is very still. So that's how you want to be in the volley, especially if you want to be hitting that ball off the sweet spot and get that feeling, that good sensation of hitting a clean volley. The last reason as to why you may be hitting the frame is ball recognition. This is so underrated, it's not talked about enough, it's a huge passion of mine. This is especially true for inexperienced players or beginners. If you don't know where the ball is going until too late, then it's going to be difficult to get in position and bad footwork is going to be a symptom of that. A lot of people think, uh, well they say, coaches too, I know, so and so needs to work on their footwork, but if you don't know where the ball's going, then your footwork's not going to be so good because you're not going to be in position if you don't know where it's going until too late. But that's a whole other subject, I don't want to get on a rant about that. Now, what's happening here is, if you misjudge the height of the ball or the speed of the ball, or you don't see the ball has backspin, then you're not going to be in position and oftentimes that leads to hitting the frame. If you get too close to the ball, you'll hit the throw to the racket. If you're too far away, you could hit the top or the tip of the racket. So here are a couple drills to help improve your ball recognition. And actually, I want to talk quickly about a comparison to that. If we take a, a two-year-old kid and you toss him the ball, very often they're going to go like this because they misjudge the trajectory of the ball, whether it's the height or the speed or whatever it may be. So here are two drills to help you with your receiving skills and reading the incoming ball so that you can get in position. Because the earlier you read the ball, the better position you will be, the more time you'll have to get in position. In fact, if you're fast, if you have speed, but you read the ball late, you're gonna be slow. If you're slow and you read the ball early, you're gonna seem like you're a fast player. So two drills I have for you to help uh, improve your receiving skills in reading the ball. Because again, we talked about earlier, the height, speed, spin, depth, and direction. Being able to uh, read all the ball characteristics to help you get in position and allow you to hit the ball clean and hit a very effective shot. So drill number one is very simple. Every time you receive the ball, you can say it out loud or you can say it in your head. You're gonna say up, back, or stay. So if I'm receiving the ball from you, 
and I have to move forward to hit the ball, I'm gonna say up. And you wanna say it as soon as possible. Definitely wanna say it before the ball bounces, hopefully. So if it's a, a stay would be, if you only take one step forward or one step back, you would say stay. So you're basically just saying the movement that you will have. Are you gonna move up? Are you gonna stay? Or are you gonna move back? So if the opponent hits a high deep ball, I wanna recognize that early. I'm gonna say back, and then I move back and hit the ball. So you do it in a rally sequence typically, or you can have somebody feed balls to you. But again, you simply say up, back, stay. And the earlier you say it, the better. I think as you do this drill, you're gonna improve on it very quickly. Initially, it may be tough. You may be calling it late or reading the ball late. Now, the second drill is very helpful for focus. It's very helpful for watching the ball and uh, certainly helping you to read the ball. So here's how it works. When the opponent makes contact, you say one, the number one. When the ball is crossing over the net, the moment it crosses the net towards you, you say two, number two. And then as the ball bounces on your side of the net, you say three, the moment it's bouncing. Now, the last thing you say is you say hit when you hit. So again, it's one when the opponent hits, you say two as the ball is crossing the net, three when the ball bounces on your side of the net, and hit when the ball hits. If this drill seems difficult, I don't think it's that difficult as I've done it with complete beginners and they've had success in it. Now, the important thing is you must say the numbers or the word hit the moment that it happens. I've had a lot of players, especially when I start the drill, they say hit like literally a half second to a second after they've hit the ball. Or they say the number two well after the ball has already crossed the net. So saying it the moment it happens is key and that requires focus, concentration, and reading the ball. So it gets you to focus on the ball. It gets you to really pay attention uh, to what's going on. It gets you in the zone. This is a great drill to get you in the zone and feel like the ball is coming in slow motion. It feels like you have a lot of time. So again, one, two, three, hit. Try out that drill. This drill is just like the very first drill we did when I did four hands and I was trying to hit the ball to the cross court target. I watch contact and I watch where the ball was hit after I hit. Get that good exaggeration going. Now I'm gonna do the same thing with my forehand volley. This part of the court is where I see players choke the most. And what do I mean by choke? They look at their target, they hit the frame, they hold their breath. All these are symptoms of choking. So the reason being is this is the finishing zone. This is where you get that kill shot. You're either gonna finish the point and win it with a good shot, maybe a winner, or if you miss, you just missed out on an offensive opportunity when you should have won the point. So check out how I aim for this red cone here. I'm watching contact and I keep my eyes gazed on where the contact was. I never look to see where my ball went because I trust that I got it. And you're gonna know by feel if you got it. So I watch the hit, I watch where it was hit. I don't have to look, I know that ball went in. Same thing there. I watch the contact, see if I can hit the cone this time. Almost. So I watch the contact, and then I watch where it was hit. So I'm really focused on the ball. That was a good one. One more time. So that one was my best one in terms of my eyes and tracking the ball. Okay. So the reason I have the cone way over there as opposed to the cone or target in front of me is I may have mentioned earlier, the farther away your target is from your central vision, the harder it is to not look up at where you want the ball to go, to not look at your target. Okay, so this is a great challenge to work on watching contact. Now, I have one last general drill for any shot, any stroke, to any intended target you want, and that is how many times can you hit the ball in the center of the strings out of 10 shots? So whether you're in a rally sequence or using the ball machine or you're just dropping it, the ball for yourself, or maybe you have a wall to hit against, how many times out of 10 can you hit the sweet spot? Okay. So maybe the first time you get five out of 10, second time you get seven out of 10, try to get 10 out of 10, and then you'll be watching the ball like Roger Federer.
I don't want you to suffer from hitting the frame any longer. So please follow the drills that I've given you in this video. Figure out why you're hitting the frame. Is it something in your head? You're too excited, nervous, some, a mental toughness issue. Are you not watching contact? Remember those two things are almost always go together. Are you moving a body part that you shouldn't be moving? You're not stable during the hitting phase or are you just simply misjudging the ball you're receiving? Try out those drills that I gave you for that. Uh, next week I will have a, my latest video next week will be about when to not watch the ball. So I'm going to piggyback on this video or rather uh, what you should look at when you have sent the ball to the opponent. This is a lot about anticipation and knowing what the opponent will do with the ball or what they can't do with the ball based on their body language. There's a big hint on what you should look at, but there's a lot more to it than that. So please tune in for next week's video. Again, I'm going to talk about when you should not watch the ball for singles and doubles and what you should look at instead. Again, this is Jeremy with Fundamental Tennis. Please subscribe, give me a like, comment, let me know if you have any questions. If you have any requests uh, for future videos you'd like me to do, any topics you want me to cover, uh, let me know in the comments. And uh, if you stayed to the end of this video and watched the whole thing, then more power to you. You must be as passionate as me when it comes to tennis. So I enjoyed making this video. I hope you found great value in it. If you did, please subscribe. And I hope to see you in future videos.